once told you something, and then decided not to. She looked up at him, her green eyes glistening with concern. Now you are going away back to your wife. Possibly you will have a child of your own some day, and it may be important for you to know. She looked away across the harbour. And I may never see you again. She looked up into his eyes again. You are Percy's son. Merriweather laughed and saw her startled expression. I had come to that conclusion myself last spring, the first time I ever met the man. It does not embarrass me. He did a wrong to my mother, but not to me. I am proud that the blood of Percy runs in my veins. You knew? I was sure, as sure as he can ever be. The woman pondered the thing for a moment, then said wonderingly, Each of you knowing all this time, but neither knowing the other knew. She thought a moment more, and threw back her head to laugh in the tone she had that night on the edge of the pool when she discovered him ready in spite of himself. Merriweather, I am now your stepmother, and it is proper that you kiss me. The kiss was not entirely motherly, and it was not until the next day that he discovered the five gold guineas in his jacket pocket. Chapter 33 Merriweather stood on the grating at the gangway, waiting for Comet's boat, and watched the proceedings on deck. The boatswain had turned up all hands, the watch below, holders, idlers, and artisans, and turned them too flushing, scrubbing, and holy stoning the deck to remove the last traces of the sojourn of the horses. He was still snorting and stomping indignantly back and forth, flanked by his mates as they oversaw the task. Merriweather chuckled to see the sight making his way down the ladder. Macrae piped the side and greeted him with full honours. Welcome aboard, Captain. Why, you're scrawny and swart as a gilly. Comet made a fast passage to Bombay Castle, and then lay at anchor three days while a draft of seamen and marines was assembled to transport to Calcutta. Commodore Waldron was expected back momentarily from his reconnaissance of Java, so Rapid should be at Calcutta by now. Merriweather improved the time by renewing old acquaintances around the castle and dockyard. It suddenly occurred to him that he had crossed Persia twice, but had never had the time to stop in a bazaar and buy a gift for Caroline. He went over into Bombay and bought a thick rug from Persia, a selection of cashmere shawls and a few knick-knacks of silver, porcelain and brass, but nothing that pleased him. He was leaving the bazaar when a furtive man accosted him. Saib, will you buy a gem, cheap? The man looked about hunched over, and opened his hand slowly almost under his chin. In the cupped palm glittered a green stone, oblong in shape nearly the size of his fingernail, and cut and polished in the eastern fashion. Please, Zaib, only ten of your pounds. Is it stolen? Oh, no, Zaib, said the man, rolling his eyes and then looking about again. Either it was glass, or stolen, or both, Merriweather concluded, starting to pass on. He heard coins jingle, and remembered the five guineas Madame Salfeda had deposited in his pocket to regain her amateur standing as she kissed him goodbye. On an impulse, he fished them out, displaying them to the man. I'll give five guineas, and if it's glass or stolen, I will find you. The man looked about once more, then snatched the coins, dropped the stone in his hand, and scuttled off between two stalls. It looked genuine enough, felt heavy, and sparkled in the sunlight. It might be anything, glass, jade, agate, or some other variety of semi-precious stone, but it was a pretty bauble. He went back to the shop of the goldsmith he had seen, and commissioned him to make a ring for the stone. The goldsmith held the stone to the light, then weighed it in his delicate balance scale. Almost six carats, Saib, 
and about as good a colour as I've seen in an emerald this year. Merriweather looked about himself in some apprehension, lest the true owner should come up shouting thief. He waited, still feeling conspicuous as the man fashioned a graceful ring with his tools and charcoal forge, then mounted the stone. Back in Comet, he looked at the ring again, and thought of the curious train of events that had culminated in this beautiful gift for Caroline. Last summer, Flora Dean had aroused him to passion, then sent him away. Mad with lust, he had sought a prostitute in the house of all nations, paid his five guineas for the choice of the house, then impetuously chose the proprietress, Madame Selfado, to quench his fires. She had accepted him, she said, only out of curiosity, to learn what a nine-day wonder was like and insisted she was not a whore, then surreptitiously refunded his fee as they parted last week. Now he had spent the fee he had paid because of Flora Dean on a gift for his wife. He tried to distill some moral or precept from the transaction, but failed. It was a magnificent bit of jewellery, he decided, putting it back in its box. Comet weighed anchor the next day and as she dropped the pilot, Viper was hove to half a mile away, waiting to take him on board. Through the glass he could see Percy sitting in a canvas chair on the quarter-deck, Sally by his side. He waved to them, but they evidently could not see him as the two ships drew apart. They were an oddly assorted pair, he thought, a harem girl and a Percy going home, crippled now to live quietly in that proper place. He hoped that no loud-mouthed nabob would hurt the woman. Percy loved her, and she apparently Percy, and he wished them good fortune. It was a long, hard beat to windward almost all the way against the northeast monsoon, and they sailed eastward to within sight of Sumatra before going about for the run to the Hooghly. With no duties to occupy him, Merriweather turned to reconstructing a journal of his service in the Marine the past nine years. Some dates and events were now hazy, but it might amuse Caroline. Comet came to anchor at dusk off the Sandheads, with Christmas only a week away. There was no pilot boat on station, and they waited until noon the next day before the pilot came aboard. Two days later, they came to anchor off the dockyard. There was a familiar ship anchored upstream, but her yards and upper masts had been sent down. The standing rigging looked frayed, weathered almost white, and her paint was worn dull and lustreless. Rapid must have endured an arduous service since he left her off Mauritius eight months ago, and a lump almost rose in his throat to see her now. Merriweather was the only person to disembark from Comet that night. It was past liberty hours for the crew in Calcutta, and none of her officers had their families there. He came to the dockyard gate with his baggage, and the duty officer, a second lieutenant, knew since last he had been there, was brusque and impatient, suspicious of a man in civilian dress who claimed to be a captain in the Marine. The Tonga was not available and he finally found a porter with a barrow large enough to transport his chests. They came at last to the lodgings Caroline had taken, half a bungalow, the other half occupied by an elderly widow and her spinster daughter. The entrance was at the side of the house, and as they went along the brick wall he could see yellow lamplight through chinks in the blinds. The door was latched, and he had to knock as the porter stood behind him. Who is it? Your husband. The door swung open and Caroline stood against the lamplight. There was something different about her, but he did not hesitate as he stepped across the threshold to gather her in his arms. Three hours later, he ducked under the mosquito net and slid beneath the sheet in their bed. Almost by the time he had entered, the old widow and her daughter had come anxiously inquiring as to the commotion made as the porter brought in the baggage. 
Merriweather had had to be introduced, and then a bit of claret brought out as a reward for their concern. When they departed, he had seen them around the house to their door. When he returned, he found Caroline in tears. Oh, Percival, and thou art lean and dusky as a moor. Caroline's narrow waist had vanished. She was gloriously pregnant, but uncertain of his reaction to her condition. He had been uncertain himself. It was something to be reckoned with, risked as a peril of those delightful moments of dalliance last summer. But now that the thing was here, he doubted his readiness, his capacity to be a father. You and your lover sighing. That was your line. Mine was the justice. Oh, Percival, and we shall have a child. They had drunk a toast to the unborn, then eaten a bite, and now to bed. She would not let him see her blowing out the lamp, but when she came to the bed she was naked, and she pressed against him, kissing his lips while tears ran down her cheeks. He stroked her flanks, then ventured to the firm bulge in her middle. Something struck against the taut skin, and he realized that the unborn child had shifted position and kicked out a tiny foot in protest against the confining belly. He accepted the fact. He would be a father, and he was glad. This concludes On the Company's Service by Ellis K. Meacham Narrated by Stephen Crossley A SAG after a member Copyright 1971 by Ellis K. Meacham This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Thunderchild Publishing and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.